Yeah. Okay. So now, yeah. So this talk is getting uh, recorded now. Uh, to begin with, I should say something about uh, Spec Science Center. So this is. Uh, So this is in Talasheri, so Chonadam, I guess. Uh, this is a small initiative uh, uh, by about four of us. And the best way I have found to describe this is that to begin with, it's not a tuition center, it's not a coaching center, but it doesn't mean that we don't entertain any questions at all. So. Uh, you're welcome to come and ask questions, but we won't be coaching or uh, helping with homework as a prime uh, motivation. So what it is, is uh, often when uh, students are interested in studying, we go to the library, but often science involves experiments and activities associated with that. And library is not the most suitable place uh, for that. So that should be an associated place. And this is a, a place that should serve that purpose. But for now, it is a relatively small place and with relatively small activities involved. But hopefully, students take interest and join in. We are also, if we get an audience, one of the motivations for organizing this talk was so that we get an audience who is interested in these activities and then we can provide uh, lectures and seminars and uh, just anything it could also be consultation in the sense that guidance uh, for students anyone motivated that was the idea so we are still in the process of forming that audience so hopefully uh, you you people will will contribute to that you find it interesting enough and then uh, you can uh, join in we have uh, some of the few things we have is a microscope a telescope and uh, activities other activities i think uh, i do not have to show it using the camera here uh, hopefully uh, whenever someone comes in here they can use it I would, I think the telescope is reasonably good. It, uh, it does a good job, especially if it is in the morning, we can see the sun spots on the sun. It does a good job on it. Is Christian, Jupish? Uh, yeah, and uh, I've been told that uh, feel free to come and uh, visit anytime it is open from, uh, from six o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the, evening and often open from five o'clock to eight o'clock uh, again. So you should feel, uh, I will encourage you to stop by just so that you have a feel and we wanna make it informal. So all that, it is not a very formal place. So that uh, only when you visit and talk, I think that gets uh, conveyed. So I'll encourage you on that. Hello, Sina, uh, hopefully that's the right name. And uh, 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 welcome. So I just started the talk and we have been talking about what SPIC Science Center is. So having said that, what lecture series is, so lecture series, what is it going to be on? So talking a little bit about uh, the lecture series, what, of course, it will talk about topics in theoretical physics, but Christian, yes. Oh, yes, uh, I should tell something about myself, apparently. Yeah, so, uh, so who am I? Uh, I am Shajish. Uh, I am an uh, associate professor in Southern Illinois University. This is in, in the state containing Chicago. This is Illinois. And in USA. So it raises a, a, a right question as to how does this, how do this lecture series go? 
uh, later on. This summer, I'll be completely here in Talashiri, so I'll be giving the talk in person. But uh, once the summer is over, I'll have to return back to Illinois and then I have the talks uh, online. So I will be there online, but I'll still encourage others to join in in person because uh, interpersonal uh, discussions, I feel that cannot be replaced in any way. Online, if I'm there, it only serves the purpose that I can be there, but I, I don't recommend complete online in any way. But hopefully, uh, we will find an audience and we can that we can at least continue this in some form or the other we'll see and this is a process and evolution uh things are expected to change uh, all the policies uh governing this so hopefully first we need an audience that's the main thing so even if it is a handful as far as they're motivated and consistently joining that's good for us even if it's a very few uh, number. So that's the idea. Any questions on that before I start on the talk itself? Anything at all? Yeah. So Sina, meanwhile, can you, can you tell us what's your background? Uh, just which class or which college? Uh, anything would help so that we have an idea of who the audience is. Okay, that is uh, fine. Okay, so we already finished about 10 to 12 minutes. So let me proceed with the uh, lecture. I have to, so I was going to say what this lecture series is going to be about. I, I would hate it to be like another class. It should not go like another class where I am talking most of the time and there is hardly any participation from there. But I do also realize that in the first few meetings that might be what is going on, but hopefully as time proceeds, uh, everyone feels more comfortable and there are more uh, discussions involved. I would especially like to not worry about the actual procedural things, instead want to highlight on things like counterintuitive nature of the, of the concepts. Uh, so I'll try to pick up topics that are, or ideas that are sufficiently counterintuitive and try to get something uh, related to that. So today I decided to choose the topics to be fractals. So that's a fractal. So the immediately the question comes, uh, uh, what is a fractal? How do we define it? And maybe I can ask that to the audience. Has any of you heard of what a fractal is? Anyone? Yes, no? Since I did not get any response, so I'll assume that you have not heard of it. So basically, uh, it requires the idea of a dimension. So what is a dimension? Usually we say length, right? So something, some, uh, when you measure your height in meters, there is only one unit associated with it, one meter, right? So that's something that has one dimension one. So length, let us say. So length, you would say is one meter. So that's one dimension. Now think about area. What's the unit of area by any chance? So area is measured in meter square, if you notice. And let's think about a area of one meter square. So that's meter square. And volume, if you say, is one meter cube. This will have a dimension of one. 
that's dimension one, that's dimension two, that's dimension three, right? Pictures, length, a rope, area, oops, and uh, a volume, maybe a cube. So that three lengths, right? So you can do it that way. There are only two lengths needed here. So I think this explains, it depends on how do you visualize it. If you're very visual, that's a visual picture of how the dimensions are. It immediately asks us, a, uh, raises a question. What about, can you think of something that has a dimension four, right? Or something that has a dimension zero, right? We won't get into that, that I will leave it as an open question. Think about it, ponder about it and come up uh, with an answer of what has dimension four or something above. What we want to address here is what a fractal is. These are geometric shapes. Or doesn't really need to be some geometric shape like this. Uh, that's what the idea would be that we will uh, have some discontinuous in it. Geometric shapes of fractional dimension. And by fractional, I mean, it doesn't have to be one, two, three, four. I could talk about 1.5 or three by two or a, a special function associated with that. So basically any number between one and two can be a fractional dimension. It can be rational and irrational. So probably some of you may not know what a rational irrational is. Uh, you study it later in the high school, but if you're not, so basically any number between uh, these uh, numbers. So that's the idea. So how do I, uh, motivate that. So let's have an outline for the chalk. So, so I'll talk about uh, what self similarity is. And if you're a little advanced in algebra, you can also say self similarity is like a recursion. Right? If if you're working in algebra, then you would associate it with recursion. But self-similarity, what is it? Uh, in very simple words, if you have us, you inside yourself, if that makes sense at all, if you are part of yourself, like the whole body of you is there inside your stomach, let's say, and that's, a, uh, uh, that's an example of self-similarity. As a comment here, yes. Yeah, Russian doll is apparently, yeah, Russian dolls are examples where Russian doll is basically a, you have a box and you open the box and there is another box in it and that box has another box in it. And you, and you keep going that and imagine a situation which it, where it goes forever, right? That's important that it keeps going on forever. And we will construct such systems in, in numbers with numbers and try to talk about self similarity. The second is scaling. And that is where the dimension will get come into picture. When we talk about the length, we associate a circumference or a perimeter, how long is the wire and uh, how does the area change algebraically speaking. And that will be something we will associate with uh, scaling. Uh, third one will be, uh, we will actually talk about fractal dimension. So we will see that this can have fractional dimension. So we'll talk about the fractals itself. And then comes, uh, okay, so if there are fractals and the concept of a fractal does exist, then how can we associate it uh, with some physical, uh, physical uh, let's say an experiment, if you really want to have an experiment and start measuring these things, how would you uh, do this? And can you associate a physical quantity with a property of a fractal? 
And for that purpose, we will talk about scattering. Like we can ask, why is the sky blue? And in that context, we can talk about uh, what will happen if you scatter something through a fractal. So we'll talk about electromagnetic scattering. So that will be the physical uh, intuition or if it can, can be associated with that physical uh, uh, topic or, or physical concept at all. So that's going to be the outline roughly. I'll start with self-similarity before I proceed. Any questions, anything at all, even if it is anything broadly speaking, hopefully. Uh, uh, tell that again. Oh, yeah. Uh, would anyone know why the sky is uh, blue? Does any of you know why the sky is blue? Why is, and sometimes it is red actually in the evenings, right? In the horizon, it is. It, it is orange and reddish. So you want to comment on that? You guys are, no one wants to speak out, but that's okay. I understand. It could be just throwing questions at you. Uh, sky is blue basically due to what is called Rayleigh scattering. And I'll come to that at the end. Let me not begin with that. So that can be a distraction completely. So we can talk a lot about that if necessary uh, another uh, day. But today, uh, so I think for the audience, uh, the first part of the talk might uh, fit in well. So I'm going to talk very slow and proceed uh, very slowly. So let me begin with self-similarity. Uh, so that's self-similarity. So the... In, in mathematics, how do you talk about something that is self-similar? As I said before, self-similar means imagine you inside you as a whole, including your head and your body inside your stomach. It could be very counterintuitive because how can you have the whole body? Because you yourself have a stomach and that is a stomach inside of the stomach. And then you can think of it. It's very recursive in nature. It's like if you have been to a barber shop, and there are two mirrors on the back side and the front side, and you're standing in between, you will see many of you behind you and many of you in front of you. That's again a recursion. It keeps repeating. So in mathematics, using numbers, how can you do this? So let's think of a some variable x. It is equal to one plus, let's say one by two, so that should be easy to work out one plus one by two and add some more to that one by four and keep doing that. And then I say that you never stop, right? You have to keep doing that. And some of you, if you are, if you have done enough of uh, mathematics, like by, by the time of high school, you've seen this uh, series and anyone knows the answer by any chance? How much is that equal to? Uh, it comes out to be two. The answer is x equal to two. So that's not very obvious at all. So let's try to motivate this. So notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this one plus one by two and then open a parenthesis. And notice that I have to multiply one with this, one plus one by two in this, and then one by four. And this keeps going on. Since it keeps going on, there is absolutely no difference between this and the original series. That should be bothering in many ways. Like that shouldn't be comforting because you're saying that there is already a number and that whole number is there inside that. If that is the case, then you would say it should be possible to write x is equal to 1 plus 1 by 2x. Right. So suddenly you have an equation now, which means that you can solve it. Like you could use the properties of algebra and solve it. And with a little bit of algebra, you will take this to the left-hand side, x minus 
half of x that's equal to one and you would see that or another way of saying this is if you put x equal to two it satisfies that condition two one by two of two is one one plus one is two so that's x equal to two so if if you put x equal to two this equation is satisfied right so that's a solution then so that seems to be if if you cannot do the algebra you just guess on it right guessing is perfectly fine when you're doing something completely new completely for the first time you don't have to be following any rules as far as the mathematic rules of mathematics are obeyed right so it seems like x equal to two is a solution in fact we will call this this is intuitive right this makes sense i'll call that an intuitive uh, solution but one might argue that there is one more solution in here right and the solution not very obvious one at all in fact uh, you would say that that's not even part of number system maybe x equal to infinity is also a solution because i can divide by infinity and i still get an infinity i add an in one to that i still get an infinity and that's infinity but then many would argue no 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 how do i know how to add infinities yes we don't know how to add infinities to it. oh what is an infinity good question what's an infinity so the question here is what is infinity uh Uh, help me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A very large number. Is that good enough? Because I don't want to talk about the properties of it. Like properties in the sense, how fast does it grow? So. For now, let me just say that it's a number which is so uh, large. So, good point. Uh, how do I answer? What, how, how do you define an infinity? I do not know how to define an infinity. Okay, maybe this is the best I can do. Infinity is a very large number. We do not have, we even say that it is not part of the number system. So most of the curriculum does not have infinity in it. We do not know how we how to add and subtract infinities. The best we can do is that how does it grow? That's the only property we can give some meaning to in infinity. How fast does it grow in a certain uh, manner? I think that is all I know how I can define. Do you want to add something, Prachi? Yeah, that's a hard one. Correct. You can just say that if you don't ask for the number of the number, then think of then whatever number you can think and continue adding one to it, and you will get the next number. But something infinity something that cannot be obtained by adding two to one. Correct. Yeah, which is yeah. It's not having to reach infinity by just adding one. And they will not be able to hear the challenge for this point of information. Yeah, yeah, I realize. Yeah, I realize. So you should repeat it uh, Yeah, basically, Prachi mentioned that it is not a number that you keep getting by adding another numbers. That it is not part of the number system itself. Does that help? Did I say it correct? Right. Yeah. It's a hard one. I cannot answer that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What is it? I don't know. I'm asking you. Does no. Like, for example, so it is the internet series that says the name is correct. Uh, no. No. Yeah. No. So the question was, does the series have a name associated with it? No. Oh, it's a convergent series, if that helps. But that's not what you're looking for. Okay. So before I get completely derailed, uh let's uh so this i say uh, this i'll put it as a question mark that's not really a a proper answer but since we are talking about counterintuitive ideas and when i say shapes of 
of uh, fractional dimensions, it will fall in this category. So that's why I want to uh, bring this up and it, it has this properties also of some similarity. Let's do another example. So that's an example. Right? So let's do another example, this time uh, clearly a counterintuitive one in the sense that this one has an answer which is two, which not, not many people would uh, uh, really uh, disagree uh, with that if you uh, once you agree the, to the point that uh, these are all, these certain algebraic additions are allowed, then you wouldn't have any problems with accepting that. But now let's say I give you, if I were to ask you that this is one plus two plus uh, four plus eight and so on. Right. And again, we ask the question, what is the answer to that uh, sum? And you might see that it keeps growing, right? So it is one plus two, it is a growing number. And that's what we will call a divergent series, right? This is a divergent in the sense, this is not approaching a number, it will keep growing. And for all purposes, uh, the question earlier asked was, what exactly is an infinity? That's an example of an infinity. We expect this to be a very big number because as we proceed, there'll be bigger and bigger numbers. So it's going to be a big number, but still can we uh, do something about it? Use the same idea of self similarity and one realizes that this is one plus two times one plus two plus four and so on. And one notices that that's exactly the same series again. And you, well, again, write that that should not be very discomforting because you identified the series inside the series. So here the same idea went in except that this is a growing quantity. But now you have the algebraic expression again. And again, we are looking for something that will satisfy this equation. And this algebra you can do this 2x, you can move it to the left. And instead of moving it, you can actually start trial and error because often someone would say that there's a divergent series, you cannot move things around. So just substitute it in there and do we get a satisfactory number? And it seems like if you were to put in x equal to minus one, that's a solution. Right? And there is x equal to infinity, that also is a solution, right? x is infinity, you multiply a very large number by two and then add a number, it seems like you get back the number itself. And this time, because you had an intuition that this grows, so you say this is intuitive. It may not be very hard for you to convince someone that this is actually going to be infinity. But there is another solution here, x equal to minus one, that's really not intuitive because this is all positive numbers. You're adding a lot of positive numbers and apparently you're getting a solution of the kind x equal to minus one and you question this, right? So that's not uh, intuitive, but that's uh, in fact, if you do a little bit of higher uh, mathematics, uh, this is uh, using what is called, I will here at this point, just use some jargons uh, this is, uh, uh, you can say, uh, what should I? So using Riemann zeta solution, Riemann zeta function and analytic continuation, so that main idea is analytic continuation. You can actually. Uh, more formally show that this is, uh, by showing I should only mean that in various ways you can convince that this is more, a uh, more natural uh, solution than x equal to infinity. And that's the spirit in which I want to work with. But this is, at this point, these are just addition of numbers. The main idea I have uh, introduced is self-similarity. The answer itself is not the relevant point. I was trying to introduce that that is a self-similar piece here, the 
the number that we are working with is there is part of the number itself. In computer programs, you often have the idea of a pointer and that pretty much is the same idea. You have the whole function or the whole library inside the library itself. You can call the library uh, inside, uh, inside a function. So that's also an idea that uses that. And we will now uh, proceed and I will use this property to get something non-trivial. Uh, that, that would be the idea of a, a fractal. So let me proceed. Any questions as of now? Am I being reasonable? It will help if there are any comments, but it's okay if there are no comments. Yeah. So the comment here is that even if, no, that's not fair to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even a, a simple uh, a point will be uh, good. Yeah. Okay. So let me proceed. And so one more concept I want to bring in, and then I introduce fractals. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I said uh, we will use scaling. Uh, that's uh, in algebra that comes out relatively simple. So if you're familiar with algebra, let's say the, this is the volume of a sphere. Volume of a sphere is, please, yeah. Ritesh, yeah. So volume of a sphere is four pi by three times a cube. Right? So hopefully that's a familiar uh, uh, idea, at least for some of you, maybe it is a familiar idea. Well, the way I'm going to write this is, mm -hmm volume as a function of the radius a so this is a sphere and that's the radius of the uh, sphere so and that radius comes as a cube so we can immediately ask the question what happens if i double the radius of the sphere so volume of a sphere which is double in radius and if you're comfortable with algebra you would substitute that or replace that a with two times a two is raised three times so that's two cube and it shouldn't be very difficult hopefully to realize that this is v times a okay. i've jumped a few steps if you're in uh, in high school but it should be possible for you to with little effort in algebra that this is two cubed times V of uh, A. In general, I can have any function. So in general, if I have any physical quantity with the idea that two times A, if I increase the size of the object, that means overnight, if when everyone is sleeping, I double the size of everything in this room. The tables, the size of your hair, size of yourself, si size of the chair, size of the room, size of the star, size of the sun. And the question is, can you make any difference? When you wake up, will you see any difference in it? So the question is, overnight, you change the size of every object around you, including yourself, double the size, Will you be able to say any difference out of it? And that's the kind of questions we are asking. So we have a, we have any physical quantity, we double the size and let us say, instead of cube, it is the physical quantity itself. And this time this is some delta. Instead of saying this is three, I call it a delta. And that's what I mean by dimension. So delta is the dimension. So what's the dimension of the volume of a sphere? That's basically three, right? Sphere has a dimension of three. Area will have a dimension of two. Length will have a dimension of one. So that's the idea. So whenever we find some physical quantity, if this is one by 1.2, then we will say it's a fractional dimension. 
and that's what a fractal will be. So I'm going to now show you something that has not a dimension of one, not a dimension of two, not of three, but something in between using simple ideas of area. So all this, whatever we needed till now was the idea of, uh, of, of what was needed to define a fractal. Yes, question. Yes, please. Uh, that's an open question. Again, that will, we will have to go very much, I'll have to digress a lot. So that's, I think, a good point to uh, keep uh, in. Okay, the simple answer, if, I, if I'm allowed to use some jargons, is that if momentum is conserved. <laughs> oh, question? Yes, please. Is there a question? I guess that's just background. Okay. <clears throat> yes, Christian. The answer is that if the momentum is conserved, then can people, yeah, momentum is something that will depend on the translational symmetry of the, of our system. So yes, there is an answer. Yeah, it's not, at least in that small uh, context. Yes. Okay, so in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, let me define what a fractal is. Or what, give me an example of what a fractal could be. So, yes, so. Okay, so let me draw. So this is called a Sierpinski triangle. And I'm going to use a uh, Re relatively simple idea of self similarity, but that is the only complicated concept I'll use or a sophisticated concept I'll use. Otherwise, everything is going to be a simple uh, concept. So we have a triangle. Let's say this is an equilateral triangle, but it doesn't have to be for simplicity. Let's say this is an equilateral triangle. Let's say its side is A. And I put in another triangle right at the center of this. I make a mark. And I draw another triangle starting from here. And this time shade the inside one. So that's a black, that's white, white, uh, white, right? Next, again, mark half of this. So this is A, right? So if you want this triangle will be of side length A by two. And this will be, so there are four triangles. Each one is an equilateral triangle and they are of side length A by two but the total is A. So do the same thing, repeat this. Again, share this. And again, share this. Right? Each time, take a triangle and share it. And keep doing this. I'll do one more step. After that, it gets very tedious. So I'll stop after that. But the idea is that you have to keep doing that. Okay, so that's sufficient. And let's now, uh, the idea is to, so, <clears throat> so that we have to distinguish between down pointing triangles and up pointing triangles, right? And up pointing triangles in this black board is black. Right? And uh, down pointing triangles are white, right? Just chalk white. And we have to make sure that we have to think in the sense that this is going forever. Like this is again going to be coming in. 
right? You have to keep doing this forever. So you have to imagine the situation that this is only the third iteration. You have to keep going forever. And we would like to find out the area, the so area of the Sierpinski triangle of side length A is the area of all the up pointing, right? All up points, right? All the black, black regions here, all the black regions here. But remember, they are all going to keep with white and white, and you want to find that. Now, if you were to have many ways of doing this the, to motivate the fractal, so what I'm going to do is so whatever is this area has to be equal to so the area of the black regions right not not containing any white chalk at all is equal to three of them right there are three such triangles it's like saying i am inside my stomach right if i am inside my stomach if i want to get calculate my weight i go into my stomach and calculate the other weight it's just that i'm slightly miniature right it's i'm not the same length i'm a different length now so I'm having three of Sierpinski's triangle inside, but each one of them is half in size. So it's like I'm having three of myself inside. I'm miniaturized, I'm half in size. So that's the basic uh, statement. Next, I, <coughs> I use a scaling argument I do not know, like one could say that this is the area we are talking about. So area should be having two dimensions, but let's not assume that. So that's a basic, it's not an assumption. We want to keep that open. So we say, what happens to a area of a Sierpinski triangle? If I want to now, this is half in size. Now I want to double it. So I say one by two raised to, if it was an area, it will be squared but I want to keep it delta, I want to leave that open. I'm going to say that I do not know what's the dimension of a Sierpinski triangle. And this will then decide the dimension of that. That will be the property of a fractal then. If by any chance this comes out to be two, then that's a normal shape, normal geometry. But if this comes out to be anything different, then we have a fractal in there. So that's so this is the scaling argument I was talking about. If it was a sphere, this will be just three, right? But now we are keeping this open. But that leads to a very strange thing now. If I substitute that here, I have three over two raised to delta times a s of a. That's all. That's the only two steps involved, notice. A very simple idea but now if you do algebra i cancel these things right so so there is an as of a on the either side you would say that that could be zero like if there are two variables giving you a zero either one is zero the other is zero or in simple terms if i cancel this out i get the equation that one is equal to three over two raised to delta like very clean but of course, we are working with non-trivial things like uh, things down here where, uh, uh, where we might be adding too many small things or adding too many big things or dividing by too many big things. So either way, there are uh, intricacies there. But if we go through this uh, with that caveat, we have an equation here. And the solution to this is how you do this is uh, you say this is two raised to delta is equal to three think of this as x if you're comfortable with if you're not yet comfortable with algebra so much you will say two raised to x is equal to three how do you find x then you will take what is called a logarithm of that so you would say this is delta times log of two is equal to log of three and you immediately get delta is equal to log of three over log of two right? log is a natural log that's a function you study somewhere in your high school so at least i know other is and uh, is not yet in uh, high school but that's something that you learn but the, what is this number equal to this comes out to be approximately 1.6 right so 
what that means is that this geometry, if I were to increase this by two, you would think that the area should increase by two, but remember, this is not the area of a triangle. This is the area of all the triangles that are pointing up, right? Those triangles, if you were to really, it is like filling in, right? How, uh, how much space is there to fill in? It is not really two, it doesn't double. It goes slower than that. It's only 1.6 times that. And another example where you see this is uh, in, a, in a coastline where if, uh, I mean, there it is a length, it is not really an area. The coastline, if you were to use a measuring scale that is more finer and finer, the coastline actually increases in size. So that's uh, somewhere you see this. And what I have been interested in is to do a scattering problem. So in the last five minutes, let me explain how I would can use this to get the scattering problem. But before that, I should ask any, any comments you can make on this argument. Right. Any comments at all, anyone? It should be discomforting. It should be, it's natural to, to have a discomfort with this kind of logic, but that's the counterintuitive part of it. That's unusual part of it. But it's a well-known fact that a Sierpinski triangle has a fractal dimension of, it's 1.58, it's an irrational number. So it's approximately equal to 1.6. <clears throat> Any comments at all? Okay, if not, uh, let me proceed and give one simple place where you could use this or, or not really use, I, I wouldn't use, that's a very broader, broad terminology when you say you can use it, where you can at least uh, relate this to something in a lab, like, uh, can you measure this sort of? Uh... <clears throat> so think of a situation where uh, you have a, a screen, let's say that is a simple, uh, so this screen, I, I should actually, maybe let's not have a screen. <laughs> let me just have a disk, right? So let me just have a disk. And that's a reference line, right? So this is a disk. And let me have an electromagnetic wave come in there and it has a property called lab uh, wavelength, uh, which is basically the color of light. Think of light coming in from sunlight, let us say, and hitting on a disk. And this has electric property and that's called the polarizability or a refractive index like polarizability. That's the electric property of the material or in more simple terms, uh, this is a refractive index. They're related. If there is no electrical property to a material, it will not have a refractive index and it will not interact with light at all. Christian, oh yeah. So <clears throat> it will not interact with light. Uh, at all. So this could be a dielectric uh, material, that's what you would uh, say. And let us say you have a screen here, right? So you have an observation screen there. This property is described in, in certain regimes by what is called Rayleigh scattering. So this is called a Rayleigh scattering. And this is how we So that's the name of this physical process. This is how we look at the sky. Sunlight comes, it interacts with an atmospheric molecule. It polarizes it. Polarizability means it creates a positive and a negative charge on it. If it is neutral, it will polarize it. And because of that, it will again emit something. And whatever we see on the observation screen is what is uh, called Rayleigh scattering. And that's why it is a wavelength dependent quantity. So I should say, let me be very specific. In general, this can go anywhere, right? So that's our uh, light can go in any direction, but let me be interested in exactly the forward scattering. So exactly the light, how much it is scattered right in front of it. 
let's say that's the scattering length. So that's F of zero comma zero. So that's the forward scattering. Scattering. So again, light comes in, there is a molecule. We are asking how much is the light you observe at this right in the front side of it. And for our purposes, this depends on one over lambda square. That's a wavelength square. So this is the amplitude if you intensity will be lambda raised to four. So blue has the, or red has the largest wavelength. Uh, well, no, yeah, red has the largest right now. So red scatters the least, blue has the smallest wavelength. So it scatters the most. And that's why the sky is blue. That's simply because it is one over lambda is to four. But what we are interested in here is that this also depends on a quantity. It's a, oh, I shouldn't use integral. So this depends on volume. So mathematically, I can write that as a integral of a refractive index, but instead it depends on the volume and assuming that this refractive index is uniform, this is the susceptibility or polarization per unit volume. So if this is a constant, then the per unit volume goes away. So this quantity is dependent on volume, right? So for example, if I keep a dielectric sphere, a glass in the shape of a sphere, this will depend on the radius cube in there. So it depends on the dimension of the object that you place in, how much is the fillable uh, dimension in there. And then you immediately think of, and that's what people have asked before, what if you keep a Sierpinski triangle in here? So do that same idea in there. And again, make light go in and you make an observation in there. And you ask, what will be the dimension of that? Will it be a cube? What will happen to the dimension of this physical quantity you're observing? And the general idea is that this will actually depend on volume uh, uh, raised to delta. It will depend on the fractal dimension. This dimension will still behave the same because this will become polarization per unit volume that will be uh, different. So. Uh, even in scattering, light scattering problems, one can associate these uh, properties. With that, I think it's right four o'clock. I will try to stop myself from it. There has been a chat uh, quantity here. Oh, yeah, so thank you for the comment, Sina. Yeah, thanks, yeah, that was nice, yeah. Any comments or questions? Feel free to discuss it. Oh, there was a question. Feel free to talk. That's easier. Thank you for. No, that was a uh, scene. Can you ask somebody else a question? Where? Uh, please feel. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, a a Android. Sorry. Yeah, Android. No, that's the name of the device. Please go ahead. Uh, ask your question. Uh, you're muted if you're not aware. Uh, you're muted, and uh, yeah, we would love to have the question. So, Can I unmute? I can only ask to unmute, I guess.
I did try. It doesn't. Hello, Lenu Kumar. It might be possible that I think since he was not muted before, I muted him. And once you mute, then I think you cannot unmute, I think. Could you chat? Could you write your question in the chat? That might help. That could be a solution. I did try. I can only throw oh, more. I can only to ask. Oh yeah, now it is. Hello. Yes, please, Lin. Yes, yes, we can. I am from uh, Payanur. Uh, I already talked to you. Okay, my question is: yeah. uh, in Raleigh scattering, the intensity is inversely proportional to lambda raised to four. Is it okay? Correct. That is correct. This is the uh, scattering amplitude. Okay. And the intensity is square of this. You have to double it. Okay, okay. okay. So, so you're uh, correct. That's a good, good observation. So this is amplitude. That is lambda four. So intensity would be I would be F zero zero. And this could be complex also. So you have to take a magnitude and then square it. Okay. okay. That's Thank correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good point. Good point. Thank you. Huh? Oh, uh, could you tell us uh, what's your background, Lina Kumar? That will help us. I am already talked to you. I am Lina Kumar from uh, Payanur Gurudeva Science Science College. Do oh, you yes, yes, yes. Correct. I do remember uh, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, Nidil, right? Lina, Lina Kumar, I guess, then, I think. Hmm. Correct, Nidil Kumar, right? Uh, from Payanur? Oh, Lino, oh, I heard at that time, yeah, Nidil <laughs> Kumar, okay, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. Okay. Now I get your right name, Lino Kumar, yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a very small audience uh, in this, so it was, but still, I mean, we were not looking for too high, so there was uh, five, people were five to six people, I think. And okay. uh, we had a diverse group. There was a sixth standard student and and, oh. there, uh, and his father and a college student, I suppose. So we had pretty okay. diverse. Okay. So, very good class. A very good class. Yeah, thank, very you. Good <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So hopefully we get to meet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll call we'll you. Continue okay. on phone. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you.